This week on All About Android, we have so many shopping tips for you for Black Friday. We're also joined by Win Tui Dao to talk about the 4K streaming or lack thereof on Google Stadia, Android's ambient mode, and why Google's one kernel to rule them all might actually be a really good thing for Android in the long run. Plus, we're going to look at some Galaxy S11 Plus renders, and we've got app news, so stay tuned because this is all coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Plex. With Plex, you can organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos anywhere on any device. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter code TWIT10 to get $10 off a lifetime Plex Pass subscription. This offer applies to new subscribers only. Hello, everyone, and welcome to All About Android. This is episode number 448. Recorded live on Tuesday, November 26, 2019. We are your weekly source for the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I am Florence Ion. And I'm Ron Richards. And we are not at all jealous that Jason Howell is on vacation right now. Oh, not only is he on vacation, he is, no. he is, he's somewhere he's, very sunny and lovely. He's, he's really doing it. He's in Hawaii and we're jealous and he deserves it. So we hope he's having a wonderful time and not worrying about the show at all. I agree. Uh, and to help us run the show today, we have called upon the powers of Win Tui Dao. Win, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. You are an Android developer at Trello. Uh, you you hang out with the uh, the GDEs, and you are a host of Android Dialogues. You are just doing so much. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here with y'all. So as I see again, Flow Run, thank you so much for having me. Yes, welcome Good. back. So for people who don't, I know we've talked about it on previous shows, people who don't know what GDE stands for, what is GDE? GDE stands for Google Developer Expert. Uh, that mm -hmm. does not mean I work for Google, but it does mean that I've been rec recognized by Google for having some expertise in something Google related. Uh, in my case, uh, it's Android development and uh, a little uh, programming language called Kotlin. So I'm a GDE in both Android and Kotlin. Uh, the there's, crowd, you, there's a crowd behind me right now uh, yelling and cheering because you said Kotlin. So just just woo! everyone imagine it, but it's back there. Yeah. Yay, Kotlin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when well, are we those... going to be considered? When is Ron? When are Ron and I going to be considered experts? I, I, Google. I, 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 I can't imagine Google recognizing our expertise in anything other than being able to talk <laughs> for two hours <laughs> about why, nonsense. Why not? GD. <laughs> They're really good at talking about Android stuff. The day um, Google calls and says, listen, we really want to highlight your expertise in being able to make it sound like you know what you're talking about, about our stuff, <laughs> then I'll be like, oh, thank you, Google. But I don't think that's going to happen. So I mean, you have a point. That's all we kind of do is try to pretend or not pretend. We actually do know, but try to sound like you we do, know what we're do. talking about. Yeah. We do. But you write code, and that's kind of – although I did edit JSON today. So I was really proud of myself today. Yeah, I was – I was in there. I built a JSON MRS feed, and I was uh, doing some JSON stuff at work. So there you go. I mean, Look really, that. that's all we do all day, anyway. It's just you know, kind of yeah. edit the JSON files in hopes that things appear on the screen as as such. So I yeah, can't tell you. There. I can't tell you. I can't tell you what JSON stands for, but I I did work in it. So there you go. I can't either. <laughs> it's okay. It has nothing right. to do with Jason Hell. Uh, yes. <laughs> Shall we get on with it? Yeah, let's get on with it. All right, Victor, why don't you take it away, sir? Well, my interpretation of a JSON file is, uh, I guess, starting to get the studio ready, but not really quite getting there. <laughs> oh, so, that's look a, how sad that is. Oh. Yeah, that's how sad it this was. This is my fault. This is what happens when I stay home. Well, that's, I mean, less work for the guys. I mean, Burke had it easy tonight. I guess. But yeah, got started right. and it was like, oh, I love I, I, not only I like that Victor uh, improvised that, but also had a bit planned. So that was I a agree. good flexing of two muscles there, Victor. Good job. I agree. I agree. So. Once again, Victor's the best. 
Yes. So uh, with Jason away in Hawaii, that left uh, Flo and I to frantically prepare for tonight's show or today's show. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the one overarching theme I found is the fact that uh, here in the United States, we are two days away from our Thanksgiving holiday and we are three days away from Black Friday. And anybody who is into consumer electronics or specifically Android knows that Black Friday used to be the day that you could get deals so you could buy presents for people who had a better deal. And now it's the day that you can get deals to buy yourself presents. So uh, we're not going to go through it all because there's just a myriad of deals out there. But uh, I know sites like Android Police and every other site has got their like Black Friday deals page. So if you're in the market for a new phone, a new tablet, a new you know, smart home device, anything, it's pretty much on sale. Um, Flo, I know you've been neck deep in this stuff. Is there anything that our audience should should look out for? Like, is this the t time to buy a Pixel 4? Yeah, here's the thing, guys. Uh, Black Friday is, it, it is what it is. It, it's become what it's become. But when your pinch and pennies or counting coupons, as I am wont to do, you are waiting for these deals to come by because you do want to save some money. The Pixel 4 has been, it's been re like really slashed, which I think is making everyone who was like a first adopter just kind of kicking themselves right now. And I think hopefully by now you've learned to just kind of wait this couple of weeks from when it's announced in October to when the holidays come, because then you're going to be able to save, let's see, you can save $200 off the regular Pixel 4. Uh, so it's 599 bucks. So that leaves you an extra $200, I guess you could spend on a case. You don't, not a $200 case, but it leaves you some money to buy a case. Uh, the same sale will apply at Best Buy. Um, Best Buy even has it for lower at $400 with carrier activation if you decide that like you don't mind um, kind of being <laughs> held onto your carrier. And the Pixel 4 XL is going to be starting at $700. That's $200 off down from $900. The other thing to consider... If you're like, I do want a new Pixel because I've got maybe the first or the second gen, is the Pixel 3 because I'm still using mine. I haven't I haven't updated yet. Eventually, I will do that. That's like a holiday thing I'm going to do. But uh, Target's giving out a gift card if you activate a Pixel 3 on AT&T or Verizon. Uh, Target's giving out a $550 gift card. So I guess that means you could like, it's and, ridiculous. yeah, and I don't even, I didn't even click through to see how much it is, but it's obviously a lot less than the Pixel 4. Uh, and then it used to be at launch. And then the Pixel 3a, if you need to get a phone for like, maybe you want to get a phone for your preteen uh, or maybe you want to get a phone. Preteen? How much is your teen? Uh, preteen's a little young. I'm thinking like 12. When I think yeah. preteen, I'm thinking thinking like 12 years old, right. but 300 bucks for the 3A, 379 for the 3A XL uh, at both Google and Best Buy. Uh, and then there's, of course, we really like the Android Police rundown. So if anybody wants to like go just get like a full listicle of all the super Android-y, Google-y things that are on sale for Black Friday, this one I think is absolutely great because it goes by manufacturer. So if you're like Flo, Iran, when we don't care about the Pixel, maybe you care about Samsung, uh, you can go see what Costco, Best Buy, Walmart's offering, uh, OnePlus is having deals. If you want a budget LG phone, those are going to be on sale too, as low as like 90 bucks. Um, the one thing I would caution going into this is to be careful where you spend your money on a Chromebook, because this is the this is the time of year where a lot of manufacturers go, oh, that stack of Chromebooks over there. You know, we should get rid of it. Uh, why good, don't we just make a, everything super cheap? <laughs> it's. I mean, it's a good it's a good way to get rid of inventory. That's for sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but you know, keep your phone on you and just Google everything. Google. Uh, you know, model name, is it worth it? <laughs> and see what comes up because sites like Android Police, Android Central, um, a lot of the tech sites are covering like what is worth buying and what is not. Uh, when I want to know, are you, did you put any pennies aside for Black Friday? Do you have, do you have your eyes on anything? Have you kind of been holding out to 
stock up on anything at home. <laughs> um, okay, so the background is that uh, so both my husband and I are Android developers, and pretty much Christmas goes all year round. So we generally don't leave too much <laughs> for Black Friday. Um, I will say that this year we held out on getting Pixel 4s because uh, normally we are early adopters and using the excuse that, hey, we need to test on the newest thing. Um, and after kind of last year, uh, we kind of, I think we're all a bit salty from all the, the slashes from the Pixel 3. So we're waiting, mm-hmm, waiting mm-hmm. very patiently. But we might actually be responsible adults and kind of wait another year for, for an update this year. I don't know. Um, there's just too much. There's too much good stuff. Um, but we kind of already, we, we Nest Hub maxed. We Pixel 3 last year. So in our Android world, we're, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. Uh, speaking of that, the Nest Mini, it's actually 30 bucks at Google and Target for Black Friday. So again, remember to buy the second gen one, not the first gen one, because the second gen one is the one with all the, with all the new stuff in it. Um, head over to Android police. I mean, we've got, there's a lot of stuff. This is a good time to go in and yeah. Or not, don't buy anything. There you go. Yeah, um, or just stay at home yeah. and do what I'm going to do and play video games. I'm, go- I'm going to be purchasing uh, the Nix Play Photo Frame, which which runs Android, um, and it is a great uh, photo frame to send photos over the cloud to someone else. Mm. Uh, and I'll be buying that for our family to show them pictures of the babies. So oh, like that's the plan. That. Anyway, cool. Black Friday. Thank you, Flo. Uh, so <laughs> is anybody buying Stadia from on Black Friday, Flo? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, maybe you want to watch out anyway, just because Stadia streaming games. Does anybody pay for the bandwidth for that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so Google Stadia has actually not had the best launch, unfortunately. Um, it's been kind of there's there's been a lot of uh, meteorites flying in the in the launch air, just to take that metaphor uh, a bit too far. So. There's been some discussion around whether Google's kind of actually deliver, going to deliver on what it's promised. So right now, the big thing is the promise of 4K gaming. Now, 4K gaming is is this bright star in the sky. I mean, people talk well, about I mean, for, it. 4K gaming streaming. Like streaming 4K, 4K, 4K gaming. gaming streaming, yes. Right. But yeah. what I mean to say is that it is, it's a very like a popular topic in gaming as it is. And so to use this as kind of like a big uh, marketing slogan for launching a streaming service, it takes a lot of guts. Um, Google's Phil Harrison had explicitly said that all games will be running at 4K 60 frames per second. Uh, but it turns out that Destiny 2 and Red Dead Redemption, two very, two of kind of the AAA hot games that are launching on Stadia, they don't. Uh, instead, they're actually upscaled to meet that. So the way this was discovered was Bungie, the developers behind Destiny 2, they had confirmed to The Verge that Stadia's version of the game wasn't the same 4K version as on other platforms. So Destiny 2 on Stadia is actually rendering at 1080p. And it's upscaled to improve the quality. Uh, so, in other words, it's it's not actually playing on 4K on Stadia. You're just you're just getting some really nice smooth rendering. And then on the other side, there's Red Dead Redemption, which is you know another major game. It also doesn't play in true 4K. So Eurogamer actually confirmed that the game renders at 1440p, and it's then upscaled to 4K on the Chromecast Ultra. So the quality of difference, very obvious when you compare it to Xbox One, the 4K version on the Xbox One, which is, excuse me, the Xbox One X. I forgot that that was a little more popular than the other one. Uh, Google has responded to the situation with details about the quality of games on Stadia. Uh, A spokesperson had said that Stadia games at 4K 60 frames per second with developers working behind the scenes. Uh... You to deliver the best streaming experience for every game, so it's in the works. It's being, so they, I ba- they, ba- they, ba- they basically punted though to the de- on, at least yeah, on the the exactly. Red Dead Redemption. They 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 were like, I don't know, talk to the developers that blaming exactly. the the manufacturers of the games for not delivering a 4K stream, right? Exactly, uh, yeah. and of course, it left us all to think that anyway. <laughs> Can we actually like get this kind of quality at the bandwidth that we're allowed? When have you had any interest in Stadia? Um, I know it was 
it's kind of been shown off at developer conferences. Um, I'm curious to kind of hear how you feel about this as a developer. Yeah, it's pretty. So um, in the world of development, game development and regular app development are pretty far apart, um, generally right, specializing right. in one thing or other. But as like a person, I've been. Yeah, yeah that's I what I mean. Like, yeah. yeah, as a person, like as a gamer, I think I like the promise of it for sure. But I think I mean, like, I think we got a Steam box like day one or something like that. And I, I, I don't think that we've had too many good experiences with non, you know, kind of console gaming that. or PC gaming. Yeah. So I think we're I think I always like with many things. Uh, that Google presents. I love the idea. I love the promise of it. But we actually, again, are holding on to our pennies this year <laughs> and just going to see how it turns out. I, I think I, I like the idea of it, but just the idea of like bandwidth and, and like just, especially like depending on what country you're in, what area of the country, like it just doesn't seem like it's, it, I don't understand how how this could make up for, you know, differences in broadband ability and like, you know, service quality. I really don't. And I think we're just kind of waiting to see how it shakes out. And I think a lot of people, like a lot of other devs that I've talked to, love the idea of like like the server side rendering and the streaming. But it's more like I think sometimes we think, well, how are you going to do that like consistently and you know across you know varying you know connections. So uh, it's a good idea. We'll wait and see. <laughs> <sighs> it reminds me a lot of on live, which was no yeah. longer live. <laughs> Well, I mean, Google's going to find out that it's very it, the gaming community is very critical and very specific, and they're going to sniff things out. And now they're going to need to, ver you know, they're going to need to work with the game developers to verify they're be they're delivering the product that they want. And, and it's it's hard. It's it's difficult to do this sort of thing. Um, but still, the price. I mean, I, I've talked to people who I don't. I, I haven't played. I haven't played with Stadia yet. One of my friends got it and was raving okay. about it. Said it. Said it was awesome. Said it was. Said it, you know. Like, you know, playing using controller with his phone, using it on the Chromecast on the TV, and just like had no complaints whatsoever. And this is more the of a normal. Is there. Yeah, the promise is totally there. Yeah. So. I mean, we'll see it's, if and it's cheaper. This. Yeah. It's cheaper than investing in a console. It's cheaper than building a PC and then buying like every single game. I mean, even with a Nintendo Switch, I'm like, oh God, $60 for another game. Oh God, oh yeah. God. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that stuff goes out the door pretty fast. Um, but, yeah. you know. We'll see. All right, so we'll see how Stadia shakes out. In the meantime, Google had a bit of an unconventional uh, new release. Uh, they posted a YouTube video where they announced the new Google Assistant ambient mode. Uh, we had heard rumblings of this or whatever, but basically what it breaks down to is this is a proactive experience that happens when your phone is charging, all right? So uh, it actually exists within as a part of the Google search app. And when you plug your phone into charge, you get like a darkened screen that's got a greeting, calendar events, weather, notifications. Um, you can also hit settings and control smart home devices. And there's actually even a photo frame mode. Uh, so this is actually very similar uh, to a lot of widgets that we've seen that, that allow you to do stuff on the lock screen or, you know, other kind of, you know, ambient kind of settings. Earlier devices, I remember uh, Android tablets had a mode like this where you could see stuff while the, th while the device is charging or while it's on the charging uh, station. Um, and the product manager in the video, Arvind Chand Chandrababu, says that uh, this is a move towards it, an intent-based way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So and saying that, you know, oftentimes, you know, we there's a lot of things we have to do uh, with our phones and it takes a bunch of taps and clicks to get into them, but there's a lot of things that we intend to do when our phone's plugged in. You want to know when's your next, uh, when's your next meeting, or or what's the weather. You know, so take away those taps and and anticipate the user's needs. Um, so it's really exciting, uh, and you might want to know when will you be able to use this. Uh, they didn't really reveal that in this YouTube video. There wasn't a blog post, and our friends over at Ars Technica, Ars Technica found out why. Uh, Google responded to them to their queries and said that uh, they said that ambient mode will be rolling out to the majority of users starting next week across the following devices, including Sony Xperia phones, Nokia phones, Transition phones, which I've never even heard of. Xiaomi phones, as well as the Lenovo Smart Tab M8 HD when placed in its smart charging station, and the Lenovo Yoga Smart Tab when you pop out its handy kickstand. The feature will be available anywhere on these devices where voice match is supported. Please note that the devices need to be running Android 8.1 or newer and the latest version of the Google Search app. So this isn't even available on the Pixel. Mm -mm. Which leads, which leads, and so when maybe you know, why would Google not roll this out on their own devices? 
it's weird because it, it, it initially reminded me of like the Pixel Stand because the Pixel Stand has a poorer version of ambient mode, right? It, it, it displays certain kind of information yes. while charging. And I honestly don't know. Like it's it's really interesting because from a developer perspective in the last several years, and uh, Google has rolled out a lot of features which are kind of in this ambient mode vein. Uh, vein. It really wants to kind of move your content closer to the user um, where you don't have to dig into an app to get like, say, yeah, your calendar invite or your to-do list or your task. And so there's a lot of emphasis on like, like, you know, things in the notification drawer, things like slices and now ambient mode. And I can't say why, but I, I can tell you that like a lot of times they'll announce things like that are very promising that we get excited about. Um, especially like for me, I work at a company where, you know, our app is about user generated content and we always want to bring that content kind of closer to the user and we get these really cool APIs and these really cool features and it's kind of weird I'm like I'm to be honest I'm not quite sure whether it's always like they're trying to like shore up the APIs or test things out they do tend to roll these things out to a limited number of trusted partners and let them kind of experiment and, and kind of work with them. Mm. It's it's just weird. But um, I mean, they obviously have a, uh, like an emphasis on it and want people to do this. And they see that there's this like need to get people connected to what they want faster. But it's just a, a lot of times, like just to kind of finish what I was sorry, my point was that um, it, it's weird. Like we have all these things that are promised to us that, you know, like that we could possibly use, but a lot of times either they're not fully there yet. They say that we're going to be able to use them, but we don't quite like, like, like the Google assistant and actions and stuff. The API is like partly there or isn't like things like slices, like it's there, but you can't really test it in production. It's, it's kind of just kind of just how things have been. Um, unfortunately. And I, I really I, I don't know. I wonder if there's a question of how they're going to open these things up to developers um, and, you know, uh, third party companies and how, you know, in terms of security or like logistics of like, you know, presenting data. I, I just don't know. There's always like a lot of questions with with things like this. Um, and I guess like figuring out the edge cases and how things are going to work. So struggles. <laughs> I, I, and I really appreciate play. you like jumping in and bringing all that up because I was totally thinking about like. I was thinking about you and I was like, huh, I wonder if like Trello could use something like this, like for ambient yeah. mode, like, you know, have a card yeah. pop up that's, you know, due today, you better finish this today. I mean, that, I mean, that would be great. I mean, if, if it's intent based, you, you intend to use certain apps, you know, like, yes, Google's weather or Google's calendar, but I intend to use Trello. I intend to mm -hmm. use Slack. Yeah. You know, like it would be great to, you know, it'd be great to roll this out and give them uh, that, that, you know, those features. It's, it's interesting, and this is kind of a developer detail, but the word intent actually means a lot in Android development. A lot of times when you're doing something, say you want to switch, start a task, whether it's internal to your own app or you're saying, hey, I want to start the camera or, hey, I want to pull, I don't know, this data from this other app. Those are actually called intents in Android. And so it's actually kind of baked in very deep into the Android, like, I guess, development uh. Uh, system. So, I mean, yeah, we, we tend to think of these, th think of things in these way and think about things in discrete tasks. So you think it would work. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll see. Um, I haven't, I'm not aware. Uh, I might just be missing it, but I'm not aware of like any APIs that are open to us yet as developers and third party folks to, to use, but I would be into it. I've, I've had people ask me very specifically about this stuff and I'm like, it'd be great. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it makes sense, right? Because you, it's it's a lot of times like other stuff, right? Yeah, I would love to have my personal Trello cards uh, on <laughs> on my screen because I have a lot of them. Uh, but yeah, like even things like I don't know, like fitness or like kind of your mm -hmm. other you know non Googly apps. So I don't mm -hmm. know. We'll see. I always kind of like cross my fingers and try to give, you know, whenever you know, try to give good feedback and try to be like, yes, we really want this, and or yes, our customers and users want this. So. Well, we appreciate that as users uh, and as hosts of the show, because <laughs> it gives us something to look forward to. Um, speaking of things to look forward to, well, you might have to hold out actually a little bit longer for this if you're a Samsung user. So the thing about Samsung and software updates, they're not as fast as you might experience them on other uh, manufacturers' devices. So Android 10 on the Galaxy S10 and Note 10, still going to have to wait just a tiny bit. So even though Google suggested the plan would be to see the new version coming to Samsung phones uh, as soon as, as humanly possible, it just doesn't seem like we're going to see much movement until 2020. 
Uh, we're talking January for the Galaxy S10 and Note 10 lineup. So if you bought one of those phones in the last year, uh, I guess you are going to be graced with Android 10 a lot sooner than uh, last year's Galaxy S9 and Note 9 buyers. They're going to have to wait until April 2020 uh, for Android 10, which by then I'm sure we'll just know more about Android 11. So, cool. It's... I just shake my head at it because it's just... <laughs> That's all you can do, really, right? <laughs> I, what, what am I supposed to... Yeah, I mean, I can't force it. I don't have, any, I don't have money <laughs> to develop this stuff. Uh, I just, I think with Samsung, the idea is that if you get a Samsung phone, you are in the Samsung experience, but you know, that kind of sequesters it, it a little bit from the overall Android experience that Google's trying to put forth. And as a fan of this stuff, it gets a little frustrating for me. Cause I'm like, I'd like to see everybody kind of uniform, but I guess that's also the, the glory of being an Android user is you get you get kind of some of these differences across platforms or across manufacturers, I should say. Hey, Wynn, what, what phone is your daily driver these days? Uh, Pixel 3 still. Um, Pixel but 3. I yeah. also, yeah, I, I, I generally try to keep a little bit of everything. I have a, Xiao, I have a Xiaomi sitting around, a, a Samsung. I did actually use Samsung for my daily driver for like a couple weeks. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. A lot If you ask an Android developer, and I mean, this is Samsung specifically, right? Um, if you ever mm -hmm. ask an Android developer about Samsung, and I probably have said this last time I was here, is that um, while we have much respect for Samsung uh, for their hardware and also their in, for their role in making Android what it is and making it, you know, the biggest kind of giving it the biggest mm -hmm. market share in terms of mobile phones, um, they do put a lot of emphasis on their proprietary kind of flavor of Android from the UI to even to how certain things work or APIs are implemented, um, Samsung can cause us a lot of headaches. Um, do you just go through a room of developers, say Samsung, and you'll hear this like kind of chorus of, uh, Samsung. Um, <laughs> and again, it's, it, they, they make great devices and I can definitely see kind of like they want, like as you said, their own experience, but, but I kind of, you know, this is just where I'm going to like put on my, you know, like um, kind of sarcastic, you know, developer hat and, Say, uh huh. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess it's not as, mm. as sarcastic. It's kind of just, you mm. know, uh, annoyed. But yeah, um, it, it kind of just makes sense. And it, it is kind of like a Samsung style to very much focus on their particular flavor and ecosystem of devices. So, well, at least they got one UI. Yes. One UI to rule them all. At least they got that going for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, going back to the Stadia topic, we got an email from Mike uh, who responded after watching last week's episode, episode 447. He said, you guys are asking legitimate questions regarding concerns of the platform, except for one big question, in my opinion. How, how long is Google expected to actually support this venture? Mm. I think the idea of streaming games is great, but Google has an amazing reputation of abandoning projects they start. With Xbox releasing xCloud shortly and PlayStation releasing uh, releasing streaming services at some point, why would anyone invest in Stadia knowing that the quote-unquote big players will most likely be successful and cause Google to abruptly stop supporting Stadia? If it's, if it's successful, great, but the reliability of Google may drive people away from buying it. I certainly have my doubts and will advise people to avoid purchasing it because of this very reason. Uh, and Mike, that's a that's a great it's a great question. We talk we often talk about uh, the Google graveyard, and and actually we got mm. an email later on in the show where that's going to come up again. And Google's questionable approach to things like Google Plus, or, or you know the various things that are big initiatives at one point, and then about three years later, they're you know they they quietly are forgotten about. Um, but I just feel like Google Stadia is different because A, is a little bit of hardware involved and B, a lot of relationships with game developers and, you know, like looking, you know, just looking at upcoming games that are coming out, seeing the Stadia logo on artwork and boxes already, like that, that's a, mm. that, that's, it's, it's a little different than Google rolling out a service and seeing how people use it and, and then, you know, putting it in the graveyard and taking the parts and putting it in other apps. This is, this is a true service. Um, so like we often call out all the things that they shutter, but things like Google photos are living on and are vibrant, right. And aren't being abandoned. I don't know when, what, what do you think the odds are that Google Stadia is around in a couple of years? 
Um, I give it like 50 50. Um, I think <laughs> it kind of depends. I, I mean, as a gamer, again, I'm like super excited about it and I, I want it to work. And I'm willing, I think me personally, and I don't know, your mileage might vary on this. I'm willing to wait like maybe uh, a year to 18 months to see kind of how it shakes up because it is very promising, right? And as like Lavoie, you were saying, in terms of just like the the cost savings and kind of more accessibility of kind of like AAA titles to kind of folks that may not be able to afford a PS4 or the newest Xbox or whatever or PS5 whenever it comes out. Um, I I I will I will say optimistic just because I think that kind of making um, high tier games accessible to everybody and kind of the also the flexibility in kind of platform like playing on your phone versus playing on like a controller is super interesting. Um, I'll give it like a year, a year and a half, like what, call, maybe call, call it two years. I think by then maybe we'll know just from, the, <laughs> from history. Right. Uh, yeah. Flow I mean, we based have GDC on your... in, Sorry. I was going to say we have GDC in three months, so I'm going to be very curious to see like what kind of maelstrom or excuse me, four months, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I'm kind of curious to see what kind of maelstrom comes out there. Um, why, you why know, maelstrom though? But why, why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't it be like overwhelming support and roll it? You know, like it, it could, it could trend upwards. You never know. Well, I mean, marketing maelstrom. Oh, like, I'm very, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. very curious to see because Google has become, uh, I mean, they have a booth now at GDC, which is not, uh, to give them credit. Like they're one of the, the first, not the first, but they're one of the few, uh, kind of mobile internet uh, companies to be on the GDC show floor along mm -hmm. with all of these console and like typical, you know, game companies like Capcom, Microsoft, whatever. So I'm very curious to see kind of as they have more time to work on it in the next couple of months. We'll see. I mean, yeah. as long, as long as they keep the development wheels rolling, as long as they keep people going to the game studios and saying, listen, please, let's do this. Let's put your game on Stadia. Let's let's get people into this. Uh, you know, we're steadily growing, maybe like maybe it's only 0.5 percent, but that could that could snowball. You never know. I mean, yeah. I will say that was pretty it. I was pretty <laughs> impressed by like the the launch title that they did come out with, because sometimes I think yeah. when you kind of see a new like gaming innovation in terms of a platform or something. Usually people tend, like I, so, so just wide sweeping generalization, like often a problem is kind of the repertoire of games or titles that you have mm -hmm. available. And I think I was looking really quickly earlier. It's like uh, Tomb Raider and like Assassin's Creed, like Red Dead Redemption 2. Like these are, mm -hmm. this is not, this is this is not a slouchy list of games. So I kind of give them a lot of credit for that as well so that they've actually done the, the work of partnering with mm -hmm. with um developers and kind of getting like really interesting titles so yeah. i mean that that does say something that maybe they're investing time and in building relationships in in this product maybe just product. don't market all the 4k stuff maybe just say it's streaming <laughs> games so you don't have yeah. to like you just well, don't that, have to worry about all the other stuff like just leave it that, at that it doesn't need to be like 4k 4k woo, and that's, you know and that's the thing that's the thing of any you talk i mean to, to mike's point you know with with you know admittedly xbox and sony you know playstation rolling out their own streaming services yes microsoft has a lot of computing power behind it sony doesn't have the bona fides that maybe Microsoft and Google have in terms of computing mm -hmm. power, but they've got the money to back it up and we'll be able mm -hmm. to probably and the, figure that the out. the libraries, but, they have all that right, IP, and the, yeah. Yeah, but but in terms of the concept of streaming and processing power and bandwidth and fiber and all this stuff, like you, it's hard to bet against Google in, in the delivery capability, the delivery aspect. That's why going back to the story about the 4K performance, I actually don't blame them for pushing back on the developers because if, you know, if, if you know, if, if if what you know, whichever game developer delivered a version that does not de delivering 4K, that's on the developer. That's not on Google. So um, yeah. I don't know it's going to be interesting. I think GDC will be very, very telling. I think the holiday season will be telling with sales, um, and then we'll just see if people are ready for this, or if, like we talked about last week, if it's more like a Chromecast version uh, mm -hmm. of gaming platforms, and it's kind of too hard for people to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll see. Time will tell. Thanks, Mike, for the email. Yes. Appreciate it. Uh, let's take a quick break and thanks to our sponsor for this episode. Uh, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by Plex. And Plex is wonderful, everybody. Plex brings together all the media that matters to you in a single app. And it's available on any device, no matter where you are in the wonderful world. Uh, Plex is there for you. You can organize and stream for free your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, favorite podcasts, web series, news, and more. You can give your media the royal treatment it deserves with Plex Pass. 
With premium features, you can bring out the best in whatever media you have. With a Plex Pass, an antenna, and a tuner, you can stop paying for cable and enjoy great TV and even record free HD broadcast channels right to your library. It's amazing. Who needs cable anymore? Uh, offline accessibility with mobile sync allows you to sync your movies, shows, music, and photos to your mobile devices for offline enjoyment wherever you go, which is key if you're getting on a long plane ride and you want to watch your shows. That's a, that's a, that's a must have, uh, with their premium music features like lyrics and custom curated playlists based on your music preferences. It makes your music library experience that much better. And if you've got photos, you can create beautiful photo albums so you can easily customize and share your favorite memories. You can get a cinema-like experience when you're watching your personal movie collection, including trailers, cast interviews, behind-the-scenes features, and more. Uh, and maybe it's not just you using Plex. Maybe you've got other people in your home that want to use it. You, you need to support multiple users. It's super easy to switch users with Plex Home. You can create customized managed accounts and make switching users that much easier for everybody. Uh, and they even have parental controls, so you can safe, safely let your little ones enjoy your media as well. And with Plex Pass, you also get the Plex Pass perks where you get, you get exclusive access to promos and discounts on partner products, a lot of peas, and you get to use the newest features before everyone else. Um, and there are even more features in Plex, such as loudness leveling, sweet fades, timeline view, and advanced audio uh, features. So are you ready for your Plex Pass? Sign up today. I've said it before on the show. I'll say it again. I've been a loyal Plex user since day one. I just saw recently they've been around. I think they've been around for 10 years now. It's amazing. Uh, all my media library is stored in there. I use my I use Plex on my NVIDIA Shield TV. Uh, I've got my media library on, on my computer. It's all networked. I've got the app on my tablet. I go to the gym. I do the mobile sync. I can watch my shows. Plex enables everything. It's all. It's like the brains of my home entertainment system. And I love it. And, of course, that Plex Pass is fantastic. So join me. And sign up for Plex. Uh, Plex is offering Twit listeners $10 off the lifetime Plex Pass subscription for new subscribers only when you go to plex.tv slash twit and enter code twit10. That's plex.tv slash twit and enter code twit10, twit10. Uh, thanks, Plex, for being awesome, keeping my home media library in check, and just being an awesome service and sponsoring the show. Thanks, Plex. All right. With that said, uh, let's get into a little bit of hardware action. Mm -hmm. Mm. Woof, we're already at that point where we are talking about flagship leaks and renders and thingy-majigs and just let's all get excited over things that don't exactly exist yet but we know are going to eventually exist in the ether. So... <laughs> uh, let's get excited, I guess, for the Galaxy S11. Yes, that's coming eventually. Uh, so some renders for the Galaxy S11 Plus leaked today via OnLeaks and Cash Caro, uh, which is not Cash Cab, uh, but but it's a leak, a leak account. Uh, the six point, I'm sorry, I tried really hard there with that one. Uh, the 6.9 inch curved dynamic AMOLED panel display will keep that hole punch that's on the Note 10. Uh, so you're still gonna get use out of those fun wallpapers that you've undoubtedly collected for those of you who, uh, who are enjoying the hole punch life. There's also a massive camera hump on the back, which, I guess is par for the course in this day and age. At least it doesn't look like a stovetop. Um, it's also assumed that Samsung will include an in-display fingerprint sensor similar to the S10. Uh, hopefully it works a little bit better because I know some people were not super happy with the implementation of that. I don't know, you guys, how do you feel about it? It's just so early, but also not because I feel like as soon as we hit into December, that's going to put us, what, like two, two, a month and a half or whatever away from Mobile World Congress. That's where all these things are announced. Samsung usually does their big flagship announcement right before that in February. Uh, it's almost, it's so weird talking about this, maybe not weird, but the juxtaposition of talking about this after we had just talked about like all these Black Friday deals. I don't know. How how are you guys feeling? When do you do, do you get excited about renders? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I do. I like it's always interesting to see kind of where manufacturers are going. Um I mean like the notch from mm. whenever that was. You know, kind of seeing what <laughs> in a sense is in kind of what, what we're in for. 
uh, in terms of development and where things will go. Um, I, I try, like I used to get really excited, uh, especially as like a, a, not that I've been developing that long for Android, but as a baby developer, <laughs> as a Aww. young, young starry eyed developer, I would get, I would get pretty excited, especially as like, as an Android fan, as much as an Android developer to see what was going on. But I mean, we'll see how things shake up, but it seems like this year, like, I don't know, maybe it's just really hip to like leak early, you know, like the pixel four, we knew about it. Like, you know, it was leaked to high heaven. We've been on the slippery slope for the past two years, even more so. I mean, Evleaks has been around for years, releasing these kind of renders and stuff like that. And it's this whole need to know what's coming and be prepared so that nothing is a surprise anymore. Um, it's at the point now where like, I'm just waiting for one of these renders to just be wrong. And for someone to come up with some crazy design and we're all going to believe it because that's that's we're not that far away from believing everything that we see. It's like a deep fake, but for like renders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's definitely I, interesting. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I I mean, I believe this, like given like the kind of arms race with like like uh, smartphone cameras, the last how many however many years and like seeing like three cameras here, four cameras. I'm like, I'm just eight cameras no the whole back is a camera just just one day i i would actually believe that like before not believing it yeah i don't know it's it's i i'm I'm always of the i i do enjoy the renders i'm always of the opinion uh i'll believe it when i see it or i'll believe it when it's announced uh but it's it's fun it's it 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 fuels the speculation and it fuels the rumors so it's 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 fun to go down that road we'll see we'll find out soon enough right i mean uh flo are you planning uh your mobile world congress coverage yet it's like right around the corner. Uh, no, because I I am going to be entering a new phase of life right around that. Oh, that's time, fair. That's I fair, didn't true. plan it. It just, just happened that I just way. Say, I just I did say coverage, not trip. But I did say. Yeah, uh, but uh, <laughs> I did. Right, it was. It was. But it's it, kind it, of hard I to cover when you know. You'll be busy. Um, <laughs> I, I did a couple of weeks ago get my first CES email, and I think I screamed and ran out of the room because I was just like, no, not, I'm not ready for CES. But, uh, yeah, so. That's the other thing. See. I don't – yeah, I, you know, I'm – just a quick note on the CES thing. Just a quick note. A lot of folks have been saying they're, they're not going in 2020. So CES, <laughs> you got to do something more. I don't know. Uh, maybe – Maybe have Mickey Mouse there or something. I don't know. We need to something but else. But I think I think maybe making it a little more. Well, I don't know. That's a whole. Not, that's a whole. Let's let's wait till we get closer to the, the okay. CES. Okay. Perfect. Just that. Yeah. So all right. But until then, speaking of Mickey Mouse, um, we were <laughs> exactly. talking earlier about Disney Plus. Uh, and if you haven't gotten Disney Plus yet. Uh, you might want to jump on this deal that Google is offering because if you buy a Chromebook, you can get three months of Disney Plus for free. Um, it went up on the on the official Chromebook site, uh, and it says that uh, new subscribers get uh, three months of Disney Plus. Uh, that's new Disney Plus subscribers get three months for free when they activate a new Chromebook between 11 25 19 and 1 31 2020. Uh, this offer is only valid in the United States, uh, even though Disney Plus yeah. is live in a few other countries as well. And uh, full disclosure, my day job is uh, I am employed by the Disney company, but I'm not promoting it here. I'm just saying that, hey, it's available. You can get it. So uh, and Disney Plus is wonderful. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking for a, a little deal to push you off the ledge of getting a Chromebook, that's a pretty nice synergy. And I think it, I do think on the Disney Plus side, it is fascinating. The number of people I talked to who have gotten it for, for gotten it through the Verizon deal or got like it's all these kind of partnerships and it's like could you know like somebody like google could take a lesson from it and that you know like and they're obviously they're doing it but you know by getting to the audience you want through other people who have that audience already is pretty genius so uh it's, it's fascinating i saw i saw today the number was like over 15 million people signed up for it it's crazy Ugh, so, yeah cool. including me yep. including me well uh, so we're we're gonna dive into something that when I'm probably probably going to throw to you because this this is a a deep deep cut as and, I call and it. And this is like this is, <laughs> this is like the cross section between hardware and software, or how software inter you know interplays with hardware, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm and I my hopefully I don't butcher it, so I'm gonna do my best, but. If you've ever heard of the phrase one kernel to boot them all, uh, which you probably have if you're here on the Twit Network, uh, it's something that Google's thinking about with regards to Android. So 
at the Linux Plumbers Conference, which is a yearly meetup of the top Linux developers. Google spent a lot of time talking about getting Android to work with a generic Linux kernel instead of the highly customized version that it uses now. It even showed an Android phone running a mainline Linux kernel. Now, the current Android kernel, there's there's some forking happening there, which we're kind of used to A, being Android users, B, just kind of watching this platform uh, evolve over the years, and C, just kind of, if you have any knowledge of the open source community whatsoever, like you kind of know that this is, this is just how things just fork out. That's how, that's how it happens. Um, but this can create some, this of course creates some fragmentation uh, and some issues. So interestingly, the Pixel 4, which she recently actually ships with a uh, recent, well, actually a 2017 Linux kernel. Um, now, Android devices don't typically get kernel updates, but uh, this kind of news would make us think that this is something that would get prioritized just as much as the Android security updates uh, that have become commonplace for Android users. Um, you know, last year Google had kind of teased this. It had announced it's in its uh, initial. It had announced that it was just initially investigating the idea of bringing the Android kernel closer to mainline Linux. So this year it kind of shared a little bit more progress, um, but it's obviously it's still very much a work in progress. It's not something that is confirmed. It's just here is this conversation that is happening around this. It's kind of like it's kind of like when you're discussing uh, moving states. Okay, it's it, there has to be a big discussion that happens around it. It's probably not going to happen super quick, but you know you're going to put all those things in place. Um, I'm just kind of curious uh, when, from your perspective, as a person who develops apps for Android in its current uh, implementation, is this something that would maybe trip you up? Uh, or is this something that would benefit um, third parties? So so just caveat is that um, I do know a little bit about this, but it's it's generally out of my comfort zone. But we're going to get uncomfortable. Same. Um, <laughs> that's what we're all about so, here, Wynn. We get, we get uncomfortable. <laughs> it's Android uncomfort. Android, I like it. I like it. All about Android discomfort. Uncomfort. Um, so I think it... it it's just under this, for, so for me, my perspective is that this falls under the general topic of the, the problem, what do they call the problem? Like the F word, right? Fragmentation and uh -huh. the issue yep. of having multiple versions of Android on different OEMs. And while I, I'd like to say like, it's, uh, like most of my life um, when I'm actually coding, it doesn't affect me. But when it comes down to, kind of very OEM specific bugs or we're getting weird behavior on this particular phone, but not that phone. Um, a lot of the, it's like, so this falls under, under that umbrella of the less, let me think, the more that, the more that we can kind of have OEMs running the same code as much as possible. And then anything that is specific to their devices or their uh, chips, their, their SOCs or their chipsets and their particular hardware and having that kind of be just these little modules that you can tack on to a common core is a good thing in general. Um, anything that's like a secure, like anything that's kind of major, like a security patch, anything that, and, and again, I'm not much of a Linux person, but anything that's a good feature in the Linux kernel that is kind of newer and that won't get out on phones anytime soon, the more that we can get closer to kind of mainline and, and having that things, those kind of things being disseminated to um, all Android devices is a good thing. Um, and like I, I can't, I can't, I can't think of the last time where I didn't have something that was wasn't an OEM specific problem that I couldn't solve or that wasn't something that I wrote myself that was a problem. Um, but this is a good thing. Um, for the kind of health and maintainability of the ecosystem in general. Um, and that, that's, that's about it. Like I, I think in my day-to-day -day life, it, and I think 90% of my life, it would not, as a developer, this wouldn't bother me. But I think it, it, it affects me in, in a whole in terms of, again, like Android and being able to kind of keep things maintainable and sane. Um, and like, as you mentioned, like, yeah, the uh, Pixel 4 were shipped with like whatever, like a, a version of like the LTS that's like two years old. Mm -hmm. um, and Android commits to supporting back, you know, several, several versions, which means that they're constantly having to deal with multiple, multiple versions of everything. Um, so, yeah, this is something that I'd like to see happen. 
uh, very much. It's obviously kind of super, super early days for it. Um, but I mean, yeah, who knows? I think it's always an ideal. Um, but you kind of make do as you can with the system. It, it's really interesting whenever you talk to some of the Android team, especially the ones that have been there the longest about mm-hmm. um, kind of where we are now is less than ideal. Um, and it's kind of interesting how these things happen as a result of certain decisions they made at the beginning, which were very good decisions, uh, made a lot of sense, but that make absolutely no sense these days. And that yeah. Google is constantly, I think, uh, along with everything else new and sexy and shiny that they ship to us, thinking about how to fix these kind of fundamentally, uh, we'll call it interesting things about you know Android and Android versions and dealing with OEMs. So it's cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, Thank you for well, offering your perspective. I, f- yeah, I feel that- like that really, I, I feel like that gives me more of kind of a glimpse into what y'all are dealing with on the development side. And, you know, because obviously we come at this very much as users. Um, mm-hmm. But I also know that I share some of the frustrations of the F word um, <laughs> and and I'm always curious, and I know and, Linux in the F in the ether of just being like a person who has been into like computers, quote unquote, for most of my life. So like I know the general like state of it. I understand, you know, but it's always interesting to see it kind of being implemented in this like really. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm imagining a like I'm imagining a uh, syringe just kind of like going into <laughs> the Android code of just like yeah. like just kind of putting it in there. Well, so I mean, the, the the thing that jumped out to me uh, during all this conversation is that you know, and the kind of the elephant in the room is that this is what Apple's advantage is. Oh yeah. yes, you know, is, yes, is, yes. Is that when when you're developing for iOS, you're in a controlled environment because Apple has total control over the kernel and the system that is that is running on the chips inside that phone, and it's much easier to debug. And as someone who's been has gone down the rabbit hole of okay, so it works on Pixels, but it doesn't work on Samsung, and we're getting this weird thing on there, or whatever. And it all boils down to this. And and you know, when I thought you put it great in that you know it's like you know decisions that Google and Android made you know ten years ago. May, you know they would not make now because the environment is that much different. Um, so yeah, so re- really, really fascinating. I'm curious to see how this goes. I mean, this is tough. This is this is like significant architecture level stuff, um, and it's going to be really delicate. So I'm curious to see but how it all what plays we, out. This yeah. is what we talk to Google about every year, though at Google I/O. Like they're always working on the stuff in the background to make things a little more like streamlined and to just because in the end. Yeah benefits the user because yep. it benefits the entire platform so yeah, yeah. and it's, it's kind of, i think feel like with android in particular it's it's like a it, sorry it's a pain in the butt thing but it's also an interesting thing in that i think that as long as i've developing android uh, been in developing android both developers and google themselves laud the fact that it's you know open source mm-hmm. uh, right. and that you know but at the same time there's this weird tension in that okay um you know, Android is open source. We have, we, like in the developer community, we love, in the Android develop, a community, developer community in particular, we love our open source libraries. And I, I, I forgive myself, I'm not a huge open source, like, um, uh, I guess, Stan. Uh, <laughs> Stan. Yeah, like I, I appreciate it. I'm not I'm not as much in like the community and, and, and like pushing and pushing things. But I think there's a really interesting tension in that you have an open system, but you have, on the other hand, OEMs and manufacturers. And I think I was reading one article about how, you know, with Linux, a lot of times, you know, the the solution is, well, open source the thing, you know. Um, But if you talk, if you're talking about hardware and proprietary, you know, like things like that, you manufacturers won't open source, you know, their drivers. They can't. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's retention between this ideal of an open system, having Android everywhere, but then the actual kind of individual kind of needs, desires, goals of the manufacturers. So I I just think it's a really interesting kind of interplay there. And it's really cool, but also, you know, results in a lot of headaches, both for us as developers and for end users. So it's just it's just cool. Um, (laughs) Apple Apple did does have a solution, right? Just force everyone to do the same thing, which (laughs) is a solution. It is a solution. It's not, I mean, if you ask me, it's not the American way, but it's a solution. <laughs> uh, anyway. uh, <laughs> it's, it will be interesting to see how this all plays out. So cool stuff. Um, all right. We got another email. Uh, and earlier in the show, we were talking about the Google graveyard and, and how you can't really uh, depend on some Google services. And I got to admit, I'm shocked to hear this news. But uh, Linny writes in and says, just read a couple of articles that Google is shutting down cloud print in 2020. 
So I went to my Samsung printer, uh, printer, downloaded their app, and got the message that they have shut down their printing service due to the fact that Google Cloud Print is so great. Now what? Uh, and we actually have a screenshot of the message from the uh, the Samsung Cloud <laughs> Cloud app that I net that announces that they shut it down as of November 1st and recommend to use Google Cloud Print. Um, and I got to admit, I'm flabbergasted because I thought Cloud Print is this great service that Google offers yeah. and I don't understand why they would get rid of it. And then I went to look for like other alternatives for Linny to use and I, I can't find any. Yeah, I I kind of went digging into the Play Store and really like what you find in there is whatever the manufacturer of your printer and maybe like HP. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe there's an app in there that you can use, but for the most part, uh, I guess if you're on a Chromebook or Android, say bye-bye to printing. Well, so well no, well not necessarily though yeah, because necessarily. because they're going to get they're going to sunset it at the end of 2020. So developers I mean, we had uh, Flo. You weren't here, but we had Francisco on last week, and we were asking, right, like, what right. is your what is your motivation about making apps? And he says, you know, I try to fill my own needs. So if you're a developer and you use Google Cloud Print and you know it's going away, here's an opportunity to make an app to replace it and make money. So uh, I don't know. There you yeah. go. There's a free idea. So there you go. Million dollar uh, ideas. We always need them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I don't know, yeah. guys. I just you know what I do. I'm I'm so still living in the past. I just send my husband a Hangouts message and I go, can you print this for me from your Windows PC? Oh, Jesus. I know, it's so old school. No, yeah. That's what I do. I have not used any kind of device printing in my entire life. I'm sorry. Maybe that makes me wow. a bad Android developer, but I've never I ever use used it with, any with the Chromebook yeah. and it, like, it never worked with the Wi-Fi yeah. printer that we have. So I'm just like, hey, I, I, I will print say, this return slip. <laughs> I set I set up a I set up a a Samsung Wi-Fi printer at my sister's, and both my nieces have Chromebooks, and my sister has a, a, a PC running Windows, mm -hmm. and it works on all three of them. You know, no cloud, not using Google Cloud Print, just using connecting via Wi-Fi. It it's works probably because it's so Samsung. It's, it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, irony. Sorry. So, all right. Well, hopefully, so there's an opportunity. Hopefully, in 2020, I'm winning the arena with the next great Cloud Print app. <laughs> <laughs> um, but until then, uh, Victor, let's go to apps. All right. So as a loyal WhatsApp user, I'm always mm -hmm. very keen to any news about WhatsApp and changes and all that sort of stuff. And it looks as if uh, the fine folks over at uh, WA Beta Info uh, spotted a new feature inside WhatsApp that hasn't been rolled out. It was in their beta version um, and it was originally called Disappearing Messages. And now with the with the latest beta, it's called Delete Messages. And while it's not available yet, basically what it's going to do is allow you to uh, set an expiration point on a message you send. So whether or not it's, you know, a day, uh, a week or however long that you want it to do, the message will expire and delete after that time period, uh, which is neat if you are chatting things that you don't want the other person to have after a certain period of time. Um, you can delete uh, messages in WhatsApp currently. I do that all the time when I make a typo. Uh, and then my sister says, what are you hiding from me? And I said, I just yep. made a dumb typo. Um, but uh, but now with, when they roll out this new feature, you'll be able to set an expiration date of an hour, one day, one week, one month, and one year for any message. Um, so keep an eye on that. If you are a WhatsApp user, it's probably coming out soon. Or sending me your password through WhatsApp, which, you know, listen, I appreciate it. Don't but do that. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, it's I don't I don't even solicit it. It just comes through and I'm like, well, that's in the ether now. I have it. It's in there. It's in the it's in the matrix. Jeez. Nothing can do about that. Uh All speaking right, of the matrix, kind of. So I don't use Facebook anymore. Uh which is actually funny, by the way, because I just realized WhatsApp, Facebook owned property. Now we're yep. gonna talk about actual Facebook. Didn't even notice that when we were putting the notes together. So I don't use Facebook anymore, which has been very freeing, but I know that there's still a ton of people out there who are logging in daily, checking to see what it is that their aunt is complaining about, which I understand, she's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but you probably hate the fact that it is blaring in your face when you log in on your Android phone. But thankfully, Facebook's dark mode has started showing up. 
So there have been some fleeting uh, scenes among some Android police readers, some Reddit and Twitter users, uh, but nothing has been actually confirmed yet. This kind of reminds me, honestly, of the way that Instagram did it, which is I opened up the app one day and it was dark. And I was like, oh, well, that's <laughs> nice and convenient. I really appreciate that. And I imagine that because Instagram is also a Facebook property, that this is just this is just how... They set the precedent, but, I suppose. <laughs> but Flo, the question is, when do we get the dark mode for WhatsApp? Yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's the question. I don't know. Right. We don't yeah, have the answer. Then you go into that app and it's like, <gasps> it's, it's so, so cool. Cool. <laughs> the, the thing about WhatsApp is that what they give you in functionality, they, they kind of hold back in design. <laughs> oh, the UI is just it's it's not good. 1997 at best. At um, best. Functional. Just functional. Yes. Functional. functional. When, when, how do you feel about dark mode? I, I love it. Um, I mean, from uh, it just, it just looks cool. It, it does feel like you're in the matrix. Um, it also saves battery, <laughs> uh, cause those pixels don't yeah. have to light up as bright. So you save battery. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, I, I think most of us are really excited about getting dark mode working on, our, on all of our apps of all the folks that I know. Um, so I, I'm excited. I like it. I don't use Facebook much either, but I think it's a good thing. And I always think options are good. I, I want to give users options. Uh, Flo, yes. I noticed <laughs> you were wearing a Kodak uh, hoodie there. Yes, I bought it at H and M for three dollars. It was a, it was one of those cool. clearance rack finds. That's pretty cool. Well, it's yeah. funny that you're wearing that, and it's also funny this comes up because also I've been kind of doing the soft sell on my wife about Google Photos um, because we have you know we're just taking pictures of our babies all the time and sharing them and all this stuff, and all my stuff is in Google Photos. And mm -hmm. it's just such a great application. And mm -hmm. then I see today that Google is now participating in the Kodak Moments Prince Partner API program, uh, which basically allows you to take your Google, your Google Photos photos and make them printable in over 7,400 CVS stores and more than 3,500 Walmarts. So uh, if you are a Google Photos user, you can order up to 204 by six prints at a time via your Google Photos account. Um, you can actually, you can crop them, you can add effects, um, and then you can schedule the pickup uh, at your nearest location. Um, and the folks over at Android please looked into this and uh, they saw that their local Walmart was charging 25 cents per print while CVS is charging 33 cents. Uh, so your prices may vary. It's up to the retailer to see how much they want to pay. But honestly, if you if you don't have a photo printer and you want a quick print and you want to, you know, like if you got that great shot and you want to get in a frame or something like that, this is a great, you know, I've got a CVS two blocks away from our apartment. We could have prints of our photos uh, that quickly and never actually have to bring a SD card or any sort of stuff like that. This is super convenient and super cool that they're doing it. So, uh, yay, yay, Google Photos. I, I love Google Photos. This. I yeah. still hand oh out. Gosh. I still hand out uh, physical copies of photos. Like, people go nuts over that stuff uh, over the holidays because, you know, you're seeing, like, your family members, your extended family, your friends. And I love to kind of be the person that hands that out to people because I think that, like, now in this day and age, because we're not, we're not printing photos the way that we used to. Oh, yeah. And so I'll hand, like, a stack of, like, hey, here's an envelope of, like, the couple of trips that, you know, to my best friend, I'll give him, I used to do this through Google photos. Like here's a stack of all the trips we took this week, this uh, year together. And she'd be like, Oh my God, thank you. And then we just have all these boxes. And like, I know digital stuff is great. Cause you can just search for it, go look at it. But it's also really nice to have like the physical stuff on hand because, you know, a picture is still worth a thousand words, no matter if it's digital or printed out. Agreed. Absolutely. I missed I missed the days when you took pictures and you didn't know how they came out and then you brought them someplace. <laughs> you waited you waited three days or it got amazing and in, in an hour you got them back and then you're like, oh, there's good pictures. And yeah, as opposed to now where and I'm even guilty of it too, where I literally you'd be sitting there and we'll take a picture of one of the babies and then turn to my wife and show her the picture. The babies are right in front of us, but we're looking at pictures of them. I don't know. It's crazy. So <laughs> All right. When do you use uh do you use Google Photos? Have you tried like I, any of like the photo book stuff? I, I do. I, I do. I love the, the the photo book. We have my husband and I have one where it's just us making su silly faces at each other. But I'm actually super excited. I'm about I'm actually as soon as we're done, I'm going to go call my mom uh, because my mom <laughs> has very successfully made the the, the leap to like because she was she's a very avid photographer, like 
you know, SLRs and DSLRs, but she mm, has cool. made the really awesome jump to using her phone as a primary camera. But it's still like, you know, every time I'm home, I'm like, ah, can you help me? I got to, you know, put it on the thing and take it to the, uh-huh. the place. I'm so excited. Like this, th- there's still like a wide market, just like as you were saying for like family and like, you know, mementos and gifts and stuff like I, I mean, I, I might actually print some more stuff out. Like our house is pretty bare and I've been like trying to like make it less bare and look like someone actually lives there by putting things on the wall. So now I can actually put more command stuff strips. on the wall. Just a command strip on the back oh of the gosh, photos. Oh my gosh, I love just, command strips. Boom. Yes, everywhere. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. so I think it's time now for another email. One last one. One last one uh, before we battle it out in the arena. So remember, if you want to send us an email, you can at AAA at twit.tv. You can also leave us voicemails. You all kind of stop doing that, which is a bums. It's a bummer. Uh, But you can call us at 347-SHOW-AAA. So if you're feeling like it and you want to leave us a message, even if you just want to tell us how great you are, uh, how great we are, or how great you are, you can do that too. Um... (laughs) Whoopsies. So this one comes in from Scott, and I think that um, a lot of y'all out there are going to resonate with this one. So while it seems to become popular to hate on Hangouts, uh, what I don't hear is just what's so bad about Hangouts. My friends, family, and I continue to use it as our primary means of communication, and to this day, I have not found an alternative that provides all the functionality that Hangouts has. Synchronized messages across all devices, including my desktop computers or anything else that has a web browser. If I had any complaint at all about Hangouts, it's that they removed it as a default SMS provider. So when other apps want to send an SMS, I can no longer have them launch Hangouts automatically. While I've occasionally gotten SMS spam, this is not Hangouts' fault. I have never received any actual Hangout spam, nor has anyone I know. Messaging on Android is indeed a poop show. And uh, they use another word, but I use poop show. And (laughs) has been for a while, but it didn't need to be this way. If Google had simply started with Hangouts being the closest thing to ideal that they had and fill in the gaps and added additional features there, life would be so much better and simpler. And I agree with Scott. And it's funny because, like, you know, while uh, Ron was reading the ad earlier, I was coordinating dinner with my husband who's on his way home, on his commute home. And we use Hangouts. Like, I stopped using WhatsApp because it's just this instantaneous, it comes through. It is the AOL instant messenger of our generation, I would say. It's just yeah, that ubiquitous. I, 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 would, I would agree with that and that it, that it definitely um, overshadowed, you know, kind of instant messenger, at least on the desktop for a good a good number of years. That was yeah. all I used. But now I don't use it with anybody at all. Um, everything – and we talk about, about messaging a lot and this is kind of stepping away from SMS and all that sort of stuff and RCS and all the arguments we've been having about that. But – Honestly, the the majority of my chat has shifted away from Hangouts to WhatsApp or to Slack. Mm. Those are the those are the two biggest apps I use for uh, chat now. Yes. Well, you do have a job. <laughs> no, I do have a, no, but I but I also have no, but I but I have I, I mean, I've got um, I've got Slack open right now on my desktop and I've got uh, at least four individual organizations of people, my day job, mm. one of my side jobs, another one of my side jobs, a social one. But, you know, like I've got uh, I've got a whole bunch of different areas where people I know are clustered. And it's this idea, this concept of like social media has we went really, really wide for so many years. And then now we're kind of constricting and, and you know, something like Slack gives you a this is an organization of just people I know who I want to talk to. And the chat is much more meaningful. It's not as chaotic. Um, and then meanwhile, my family and like my wife and everybody who I need right. to is on WhatsApp because it's it's data based. So you can do it with Wi-Fi. It's, yep. it, it, tra- it transfers media cross platform better than anything. It just works. I don't know. When, when what are your main uh, kind of chat yeah. uh, things happening on? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Actually, I'm very like I, I feel you, Scott, because I think for a long time, my close group of friends and my family, we all were on Hangouts, or my family were on SMS. But it, you know, it was I was able to get SMS through Hangouts, and I think the only reason that we ended up moving off of uh, off of Hangouts is because of kind of this like, okay, Hangouts is going to go away eventually. Y'all have to find something else. And I think yep. for my close group of friends, we're on Signal. My mom still like chats on Hangouts with me. And I mean, but it still had like a lot of features, like the fact that it's integrated with SMS, you could do voice calls. Um, and okay, so I should say like the, the my opinions 
previously and now are my opinions and not the opinions of Trello or my mm. company at last hand. Um, I just feel like it's, it's interesting because I feel like, like you mentioned Slack and I kind of even suggested to my group, close group of friends, should we start a Slack channel? But it feels too heavy. You know, it works for yeah. organizations. It works for multiple streams of communication. But if you're just with your family, your friends, you don't need all that. And I, I can't help I, but... Yeah, I agree. And, and if you have tech minded friends, it's a little easier. Like so one, one of my Slack channels is um, a pinball community, but it's from the Bay Area. Right. So in San Francisco, a bunch of people from pinball also worked at Slack and very early on right. started it and evangelized it and brought non tech people in it. And now there's I mean, like I'm looking at it right now and there's um, I mean, I'm trying to see uh, before I can see how many people that were in it. Um, but there's like 200 or some odd people in this and there's all these channels and all this great kind of community happening, but I can't, I, I don't have that in the New York city pinball scene. You know, like it's not, I think that the tech bacher nature of the Bay area helped it happen. And there's a certain education. Like I thought about, you know, can I move my family from WhatsApp to Slack? And I was like, mm. Nope, it's going to be too much. It's too heavy. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I just wonder also, like, as you were saying, like maybe folks that are a little more tech savvy or more, a little more kind of uh, interested in, say, privacy and security, the fact that, you know, things like, I don't know, uh, like WhatsApp and Telegram and Signal have end to end encryption, whereas Hangouts mm -hmm. does not. And I don't know, like, I think that also came part of it. That's like kind of why my husband and I switched to just doing Signal. I think we had that concern. But um, while my, you know, like my family or other folks that are not quite as tech savvy might be generally like concerned about security and privacy. They don't have that very specific concern. Um, so I don't know, like I, I kind of, I'm, I'm going to miss it. And I, I'm not sure what the deal is. I feel like everyone wants to beat Slack. Like, and that's just my wild kind of throwing it out there opinion. It, it's just, I, I don't get it either. I think that Hangouts worked. And the, the, the hard thing I think about starting a new chat app often is getting that critical mass of people using it so that it makes sense for a person to use it because 10 of their friends or 10 of their family use it. And like Hangouts has that. Um, yeah. But I don't know. And yeah. also maybe it's also an international thing. Cause I know like, while maybe this is just my experience. Like most of my U S friends use Hangouts. I know like I have friends that have family in Asia that use. We WhatsApp and there's another one. Is it WeChat? We, WeChat. Yeah. We, WeChat. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that maybe the, maybe in terms of becoming more competitive, they're like, Oh, well maybe we need to start competing with, whatever the regional chat is. I don't know. I don't get it. I, I will miss Hangouts very much, but we've all jumped ship to Signal for better or for worse. Yeah. I'm on I'm on Discord, by the way. Just like uh, not... I, yeah, nobody, just nobody's really on my, Discord. Just, just for all my social stuff, like my online socialing, socialization, um, yeah. like Padre has a Discord. And I'm like in there. Well, again, and talk but to again, folks, Discord, like, Discord is a very tech based and or gamer based. Exactly, platform. that's the other thing. Yeah. Is like yeah. I don't have any of like my IRL friends. All my IRL friends and I still SMS. So yeah, and and what's interesting is that like I'm, I, you know me, I'm fully in the tech world, but I'm yep. not in the gaming world, and I don't even have I'm not, I've, I'm I don't have a single Discord I've ever logged into. Yeah, so. it's yep. it's a minefield. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that said, we can talk about chat and messaging all the time, but uh, we're coming to that point in this program. It's time to do the arena. So many enter, <laughs> but only one lives. Android Arena. All right. Flo, do you want to uh, share the results of the show that you weren't on? Uh, sure. So last week... <laughs> There were three folks, not including me, uh, battling out in the arena. And mm -hmm. it looks like Lo-Fi Radio took it. Uh, who was that? Was that Francesco? Lo-Fi Radio was Francisco. Francisco Franco Francisco? came in came in with the, came in with the win for the guests, the rare win, and broke my streak. I don't for those keeping track at home, I think I had like three or four number one wins in a row and and yeah now i'm down and now with that one uh so what, what victor put up the results again I, it, it went away too quickly um right. yeah so lo-fi was francisco tennis jason. was jason and mm -hmm. ubiki touch was me and i came in last there which is a rare you know that's crazy so um with those results uh i'm still in it i just want everyone to know um wade county is back in the chat room we missed wade county but uh he's there with our with our tally and through 46 weeks we're almost done with the year um 
Jason is now in last with 98 points. I am in third with 103 points. The guests uh, are, are moving away from me firmly in second place with that win by Francisco with 120 points. Flo, you are still in first with 149 points. Wade County claims you are the 2019 arena champion, but I have not given up hope. We saw six still weeks. So. <laughs> I still believe anything can happen, and I still believe that I'm going to stumble upon the magic uh, super first place prize and get 20 points for a win uh, mm. at some point. But mm. uh, yeah, mm. uh, <laughs> we'll never know. Uh, mm. But that said, uh, that means I go first. Yes. Um, and and since no one is in the studio, uh, we're not going to actually have live demos of the apps. Rather, Victor is going to pull up the Google Play Store uh, listings, and we'll look at the screenshots for each app. Uh, and Thanks we will describe everyone for bearing with us we'll, this week. We'll describe them. Yeah. Thank you. You know, we're we're going lo we're going lo-fi this week. But uh, so my app uh, this week is called Zone Launcher. One swipe edge launcher and drawer. Um, and this is a, like, it's, it's very self-explanatory. Um, this is a very cool minimalist launcher that uh, is able to be gesture based so that if you swipe from the left or right, uh, you can reveal a app draw. Um, and what's neat about that app draw is that you can specify the individual apps that appear and you can organize them uh, via color-based groupings. Um, and this design is pretty nice in that they kind of lean into the Google, the red, blue, yellow, green design of Google here. And um, you're able to organize your apps in an easy kind of way to access. And you can kind of declutter your, your, your main screen on your phone and kind of bury all of your apps within, uh, within this one app and keep it hidden and only appeared when you swipe left or right. Um, it gives you controls over uh, where the swipe area is, of course, as you would imagine, um, and ultimately um, also allows you to uh, you know, edit the colors uh, and edit the theme. Um, they have different icon packs that you can load in. Um, you can set the opacity and the background colors. Um, you can change the size um, of the action buttons and all that sort of stuff. So you're basically able to um, adjust pretty much everything. Um, you can uh, uh, adjust the trigger area, uh, the swiping area to either be the top left, top right, center left, center right, bottom left, bottom right. So you can completely customize this to your, you know, uh, your needs. If you have a big phone and you have a hard time extending your finger in certain ways or things like that, this is a great kind of option. It gives you a different way to access with your um, uh, with your phone. It also has the ability to turn on small hand mode, which uh, will display the icons in a smaller window for easier reach if you've got small hands. Um, and if you're a lefty, I know that a lot of apps are not designed for lefties. They actually have a left hand mode uh, that will display the apps uh, oriented to the left side. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and they have a um, they have a f uh, full version. It's free in the Google Play Store, but there's an in-app purchase uh, where you can get an unlimited number of app shortcuts, an unlimited number of categories and zones, unlimited cu you know customization. You can unlock all their action buttons um, and m many more things. And that's just 99 cents. So uh, if you want to support your devs, just 99 cents in-app purchase, you can get the full version of, uh, of this Zone Launcher app. Uh, but it's free in the Google Play Store. So if you're looking for a different way to access your, uh, your apps and use your phone, check it out. Uh, it's pretty good. So there you go, Zone Launcher. I like that it lets you use different icon packs. That's For me, that's always yep. a draw. I, I want to use different icon packs. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so when uh, you are the guest, so why don't we? Uh, why don't you tell us yeah. about tiny, tiny Room Stories Town Mystery? Oh, I'd love to. So, if you are like me and you have fallen into the deep, deep pit of escape room fanism, um, I love escape oh. rooms. Um, and you find yourself jonesing because you're not just currently locked in a room and have an hour to escape. Uh, there is Tiny Room Stories Town Mystery. So basically it is very much like an escape game, a puzzle game. Um, and without going into too many spo too many spoilers, uh, you are a you are the protagonist. And there's it's it's got this really great style of kind of again, escape puzzle game. But it has this really kind of lovely, um, almost like looking into a dollhouse kind of motif, but uh, very slick. It's actually kind of got more of a noir theme. You know, you're kind of figuring out what happened to your father. There's like this underlying mystery. Um, it's not actually that kind of like, you know, even though it looks kind of um, 
I say like not lo-fi, but, you know, kind of like, you know, fairly simplistic, but still well done graphics. Um, it has a very interesting, you know, storyline and it's all based around perspective. So you have this like little set, you know, it, it, is, it kind of looks like a little digital dollhouse and it's up to you to kind of move around, like change perspective, kind of play around with things and figure out how to, you know, solve different puzzles. Um, so if you're into mysteries, if you like escape rooms or if you just like, like solving puzzles, or if you just are a nosy person and like to check every corner of a room, every single wall, um, you might really like a tiny room. Um, it is ad supported and they have this really interesting notion. It's the story is not complete. And generally what they'll do is they'll release a chapter every month or so. Um, and there are season passes, which you do pay for. I, be, I can't remember the last time I did buy the season pass, but I, I can't remember how much it was. And I wasn't, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have another phone with me, so I couldn't <laughs> install it and check, but, um, you can pay for like, say a season, uh, of content and that's about six or seven chapters. Um, it's really fun. It's really neat. Uh, everything is super clever and it's a nice, just kind of like, it's a really light kind of game. You can put it down, pick it back up. If you really get stuck, there are hints. Um, I think, I think with the kind of typical of games like this, if you need a hint and you haven't paid, you generally have to watch an ad or something. But if you buy the season pass, you get hints for free. Um, but it's a really fun way to kind of tease your brain and solve a mystery, which is of yet unsolved. But um, I would definitely uh, check it out if you are the puzzly type. Cool. Thank you, Ben. Very cool. Love a good puzzle. I love the graphics on this. Just, uh, this makes me want to build a dollhouse, though. Now I want to, like, put a dollhouse together. <laughs> uh, all right. So I had to put headphones on because it's, uh, in case anybody's wondering, it's raining and it's so loud against the window that I couldn't hear you guys. <laughs> and I didn't want to turn up the volume anymore. So uh, we're going to do it this way. We're going to do it this way now with, with headphones on for the rest. Um, now, my app pick is purely utilitarian and it just, it came about because I was trying to find some new apps that could connect between Android and my PC. I do have a PC that I use primarily as my work machine and uh, it's my workhorse. I love it. And I'm coming to you right now from it, not from the Chromebook. Um, now this, this is called PC to mobile transfer. Send files anywhere. I know. Super, super sexy name. Uh, it's actually, I like it because it is kind of FTP based. So if you're familiar with FTP, you'll be able to figure this out no problem. Uh, it's purely for file sharing between Android and Windows. I know that we've talked about, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Air, AirDroid. Uh, there's a bunch of other apps out there that kind of do this. I like this because it's good for just like giant bulky file transfers. And uh, lately I've been doing a lot of uh, data maintenance between my different devices. It just want to make sure that I have things backed up. Just want to make sure um, that my phone is kind of nice and cleared out when I transfer it over to the new phone in a couple weeks. Uh, very easy to use. So you have to get the Windows app, which is called FTP Manager Lite which is free, you install it, and then PC to mobile transfer basically lets you access all the files and folders on your device, including the SD card, uh, and it lets you create new folders or just simply move and delete files as you need them. There's no physical tethering required, uh, and when you're finished, all you have to do is exit the app, close the connection, and it's done. There's nothing that's on in the background, which is kind of one of the reasons that I didn't like apps like push bullet and any droid. I just didn't want to have like, you know, stuff that was open in the background. So you can use it between Wi-Fi or mobile data. Uh, and it creates like your own, um, unique login with username and password. So you don't have to worry about, you know, someone jumping in and figure out what's going on. So PC to mobile transfer, send files anywhere. It's free. There's ads, but you know what? Cool. Ads, help devs. Support your devs. Uh, I exactly. like that Flo. Flo thinks she's got the this year's arena in the bag. So she's just, uh, <laughs> you know, she's mailing it in now. And uh, Listen, with PC I to mobile. Be, for, I uh, am actually using this app. I'm not just, you know, but yeah, yeah it's true that, that my app, my foray into apps has been a little uh, limited lately as I've been 
busy. Hey, you're, sit, you're 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 in a very good position. So if you want to take it easy through the rest of the year, that's that's your prerogative. Mm-hmm. All right, so. PC to mobile transfer, tiny room stories, town mystery, and zone launcher. Uh, those are your apps this week. You can vote in, in the arena. You want to go to twit.to slash AAA poll 448. That's twit.to slash AAA poll 448. And you can vote for your favorite app. And the question on everyone's mind now is what is Victor going to choose? Is it going to be zone launcher, PC to mobile transfer, or tiny room stories? And he goes tiny room stories, town mystery. Oh, and he did it. Did he do it or not do it? Yeah, I did it. It doesn't always Victor? show right after. He did. Oh, okay. he did it. There you go. All right. So uh, when feel, uh, you know, relish in the fact that Victor's got your back. I'm doing a victory dance. Sorry. I tried. All right. Well, tune, Definitely tune in next appealing. week to see. Tune in next week to see who's the victor. Um, if oh, who's the victor? It's all oh, victor's always the victor, but who will be the winner? Uh, that's the question. <laughs> so awesome, uh, Win! Thank you so much for joining us this week. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, where can people find you on the internet? What What do you want to talk Please. about? Uh, share your wares with our audience. Oh, my wares, uh, my many wares. So, um, I occasionally do videos and blogs uh, about Android things. Uh, uh, my website is randomlytyping.com, where you can generally find all my things. I'm pretty active on Twitter at Queen Code Monkey. Uh, in particular, uh, sorry, this is a very developer specific thing, but if you're a fan of Kotlin, I will be actually. Be at Kotlin Conf uh, next uh, next year, next week uh, in Copenhagen, and I'm actually doing uh, live stream interviews with a lot of the speakers. Oh. Uh, so if you're interested in Kotlin and the myriad of ways that people are using it, not just for Android development but for server backend, uh, government stuff like uh, industry stuff, uh, please check it out. Um, it is in the European time zone, so if you can't watch the live stream, uh, wait for the videos to come up. But definitely, um, if you're interested in Android or Kotlin or things engineering, uh, come find me on the internet. <laughs> Win, thanks so much for being on the show this week. I just love getting your perspective on all the stuff going on. And also just, you know, selfishly, it's fun to be able to hang out with you here. Oh, <laughs> so, thank you for yeah. you too. Two hour <laughs> mandated hangout. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh Ron, what do you have to plug this week? I don't so, much, what do you have going on much. besides eating? I don't have much to go on, uh, just eating, getting ready for the weekend and uh, hanging out with the babies and trying to get some work done in the downtime. But, uh, Victor, I put a link in the document. If you want to go on Instagram, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram at RonXO, and everyone's been posting pictures of themselves in 19, in 2009, uh, but I don't really look any different than I looked in 2009. <laughs> so I posted one of me in, of me in 1999. So uh, that you can see how I looked 20 years ago uh, while at a hardcore music festival in Detroit. So uh, there I am. The same. Just uh, right. just poofier hair. That's it. And, <laughs> and, and, and that is what we looked like in the 90s. So uh, there you go. So that's all I got. Flo, how about you? What do you got going on? Uh, well, I don't have anything about what I look like in the 90s, uh, but I am – Hanging around here, of course, you know, uh, this week I am also have a podcast called Material Podcast with Andy Anatko that publishes on the Relay FM network, and we are putting out an episode this week, so please stay tuned for that. I'm also, uh, in addition to eating, I'll also be working on Honestly Tech this week, so the podcast will be back next week, I'm excited to say, uh, because... Gosh, it's just been a really busy time uh, for writing. So you will see a lot more from me on the Flow Feed next week, florencion.com. Um, I've just been working, working, working on all sorts of uh, gift, uh, not gift guides, but guides, uh, stories, how to's. There's a lot of stuff coming out from me in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and of course, until then, you can always follow me on social meds. Uh, thank you, everyone for everything yeah. this week. And Victor, do you have anything that you would like to plug, sir? Uh, no, just <laughs> twit.tv. <laughs> oh, Victor's a company man through and through. <laughs> yes. Victor, thank you so much for everything you do for us. Uh, and I'm sorry that I could not be there to provide some company in the studio, but I hope that um, you felt our presence through the Skype window. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's, it's a little lonely here, but it's okay. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. It's, is there anybody it's all, in the it's audience all right, this Flo. week? Should it, it's, say, it's, say hello to him? Uh, I think Burke's in the corner somewhere. Oh, uh, poor that's Burke. Burke in the oh, corner. Yeah. <laughs> nobody puts nobody puts Burke in the corner. No. It's it's only right. it's well, only Thanksgiving week. So. I'll do my best to be in next week. So that <laughs> I, y'all are. Not I was alone. gonna say before, before Flo takes us out, uh, Victor, Burke, everyone else at Twit, and all of our listeners in the United States have a great Thanksgiving. Hope you get to enjoy the holiday with your loved ones and family and whatnot, and and uh, don't spend too much money on Black Friday. Okay. Yeah. I'll, just. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> uh, it can be hard. So that is it for this week. Uh, that was all about Android. And that's it for this week. So this podcast publishes every Tuesday evening. So right after we are finished with this live stream, you will be able to find us in your podcast feeds uh, or you'll be able to watch us on video. You can actually subscribe to us at twit.tv slash AAA. That's A-A-A, uh, not associated with the American Automobile Association, uh, completely independent from that. You can leave us a voicemail at 347-SHOW-AAA. Like I said and begged earlier, we do miss hearing your voices, so please send us one if you'd like. You can also send us an email at AAA at twit.tv, whatever you have on your mind, uh, opinions, questions, concerns, uh, or maybe you just want to say hi. We'd love to say hi back. Uh, finally, please do follow us, twit.tv on the social networks. Uh, Instagram is a really fun one. Uh, There you can go to twit.tv. You can find us there. uh, Behind the scenes look at what's going on in the studio. Uh, You know, just kind of seeing what the host's shenanigans are up to. What host's shenanigans are up to. I was hoping you say that a little bit better. Uh, Also on Twitter, at twit. And of course, uh, we will be here next week. So until then, we're going to say... Have a great week, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Yay! Thanksgiving, (laughs) y'all.